amount of repetition in our service. The words of the gospel are almost the same as the words in the canticle that we just said together. Now this repetition is intentional. It's part of the choices for the lectionary, and I chose them because I wanted to show you that many of the prayers in our Book of Common Prayer actually come from the Bible. Canticle 15 and its right one counterpart, Canticle 3, also known as the Magnificat, are found in the daily office. That's a section of the prayer book for the services that we are to pray either together or alone every day, every morning, noon, and evening. Today, we are reminded this particular prayer or song comes from Luke's Gospel, where the son by Mary, the mother of Jesus, before he was born. In repeating the words of the Magnificat today, I also wanted to impress upon you how this song is part of a long tradition of songs sung by women throughout the Bible, and how important it is to pay attention when biblical women sing. The women of the Bible have been singing for a long, long time. Scholars believe that the oldest portion in all the books in all the Bible is not the story of God creating the world in Genesis. It is not the account of the Israelites freeing slavery in Egypt. No. The oldest, the most ancient written material in all the Bible is found in the fifth chapter in the book Judges in the Old Testament. And that chapter is a song sung by a woman, the prophet, military leader, and judge named Deborah. And it tells how Israel defeated a threat to its people by the heroic act of another woman named Jael, who killed the leader of their enemy. It's a song sung by a woman that lifts up the act of another woman as evidence of God keeping God's promise to protect God's people and rescue them from oppression. Deborah's song isn't the only one that praises God and sees God active in the life of God's people. The song of Judith at the end of the book, Judith has a similar message. There is also the song of Miriam in the book Exodus, where Miriam played the tambourine and sang of God's saving act, rescuing God's people from slavery in Egypt by parting the waters of the Red Sea to make a safe, dry land for them to walk on. The song of Hannah in 1 Samuel expresses gratitude that God ended her barrenness and in so doing also praises God by saying, God notices, embraces, and frees the forgotten, those who go unnoticed by most of the world. The song of Hannah points to how God likes to reverse the world that we created to make it more like how God intends us to live. Today we hear two more women sing in the gospel. Elizabeth's joyful song praises God and praises Mary for her belief that God fulfilled God's promise. Her song might be shorter than Mary's, but it is no less important. For Elizabeth proclaims Jesus Lord. She's the first person to do so in this gospel. That she makes such a proclamation before he is born may point to these words being written long after Jesus' resurrection, but they are still meant to impress us with Elizabeth's belief that through Mary's obedient trust in God, the Savior is coming into the world. We can also see this when, Mary, when Elizabeth called Mary blessed among women. While this phrase has become kind of a common religious way of referring exclusively to Mary, it has been used in some of the other songs women sing in the Bible to refer to any woman in Israelite history who helped deliver God's people from danger and evil. Now, this might disappoint some who like to think the phrase only refers to Mary, but it doesn't have to. It can help us realize how important women are in the salvation history of the Bible, and recognize the salvation Mary sang about in the next song we hear in today's
his gospel. The Magnificat, Mary's song, has been both celebrated and censored for centuries. It is a song of liberation on many levels, personal, social, moral, and economic. It is a song that resonates with the oppressed, which means leaders of oppressive governments sometimes bear it, like the Guatemalan government did in the 1980s. It's a song of joy. Mary sings how God has finally fulfilled God's promise to save God's people, and she is all too happy to be part of it. Her song names how God chooses solidarity with the poor and the suffering in order to heal, redeem, and liberate all people. It's a song of revolution. Mary sings about how through her amazing pregnancy, God had already lifted up the lowly, sent the rich away empty, brought down the powerful, filled the hungry. The world has been turned upside down. God has acted, not through the wealthy, influential, powerful, the royalty, the natural born leaders, or the men of high status. God has acted through someone without financial wealth, without high status, without all the things society deems important or valuable. Through a poor woman in a small backwater town. And through this woman's sacrifice, God has liberated God's people from the tyranny of sin and evil. This has led scholar and former Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright, to call Mary's song the gospel before the gospel. It has inspired other scholars to call Mary the first and model disciple because she believed God was keeping God's promise and lived into that belief by sacrificing any security she might have had. We still sing or recite Mary's song to this very day as we did just a few minutes ago in place of the song in this morning's liturgy. And I wonder, when we recite it, if we feel any connection to the words, or if we are inspired by the belief of a woman who said yes to God, or if we notice the dark side of her song. You know, the part where the rich are sent away empty. The powerful are brought down. Such reversal will not feel as good to them as it does to the hungry who are filled with good things. Today, when I see people struggle with the many changes caused by the pandemic, and changes in the economy, like folks demanding higher pay and better jobs, I can't help but wonder if we are hearing the whisper of the Magnificat behind these changes. It makes me wonder at the discomfort. Like the discomfort previously large churches that once boasted thousands of people and a million dollar budget now feel as membership drops and giving declines. Or the institutions that perhaps abuse power and employees and now struggle financially. Are they not more powerful, feeling fearful that they are being cast down? Mary's song also makes me think about how I experience discomfort in a way that gives me hope. Because when I feel cast down or empty, sometimes I'm feeling the power of oppression, or there might be something else going on. It makes me look at what's happening around me and wonder if something else, something good is happening, something liberating, something revolutionary, something joyful, that means change like the kingdom of God is here. It's a good discernment tool, and it makes me wonder if discomfort can signal that God is at work in the world right now. And as for those being displaced, the lofty who now feel lowly, hope is not lost for them. They are perhaps free.
for the first time to discover God has not forsaken them. It's quite the opposite. God is with them. The promise of God is not the promise of punishment and violence. It is the promise of mercy, the promise of love. As Mary's song still testifies, God has not given up on us. This is the promise we see in all the songs the women of the Bible sing about. And that is why, when the women of the Bible sing, empires break into a sweat and tremble at the threat of their decay. When women of the Bible sing, the past is remembered not with nostalgia, but as a time when God stepped in and saved God's people. When women of the Bible sing, the poor, the suffering, the lonely, and the fallen hear the good news that God has not forgotten them and is with them and will lift them up. When women of the Bible sing, people find hope in difficult times. When women of the Bible sing, the kingdom of God gets a little closer. When women of the Bible sing, there is joy. And perhaps even the encouragement and the strength we all need to carry on, trusting God and growing closer to Jesus as we persevere in loving God and each other. All of this can happen when we listen to the women of the Bible 